Right, so in true Disney style disaster, so what does that, what does that mean? So if you, any Disney film always starts with a catastrophe. So whether that is, you know, Bambi, I'm still, not emo I'm still emotionally scarred from being five when, when I first saw that. Uh, if you're looking at Elsa and Anna's uh, 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 parents passing away, and poor, poor Nemo, poor Nemo getting, getting accosted by a dentist. Uh, I think Rob's up next from my dentist, so maybe he knows a, a bit about that. Um, so what was our disaster? So each business area in true style, I think this will resonate with most of the, most of the room, uh, provided a resourcing forecast last year. Now, the forecast, we thought we'd covered everything. We asked them the questions about growth and about attrition. Can you tell us exactly what's, uh, you know, what your attrition looks like? It's about 15% across, across some of our areas. Is that going to be consistent? You know, risk, for example, you think they'd be all over the numbers and knowing what was going on. Actually, you know, they were probably the worst. Um, they predicted that we would have uh, eight hires for the year in risk because it's a really settled team. No one will ever leave. Fast forward to May, and we've already recruited 30 people in risk. So I think that's probably a consistent theme that you'll see across uh, probably on a lot of some uh, a lot of your business areas as well. So actually, the number, the magic number, 491 perm hires was produced. That's what we'll need this year with attrition, with growth. What happened next? So. The business areas didn't know about the priorities for each different business area. So if you think about retail growth and what that will mean, then uh, actually we might need more credit risk underwriters because we're doing more mortgage business. Actually, the, the business areas didn't talk to each other. So it was really uh, a not a considered, considered approach. Um, when you're looking at um, yeah, any support to bring in that resource, so training teams, recruitment teams, Everything else wasn't actually kind of factored in from the business areas as well. Even their kind of own academy coaches and trainers in certain areas, you know, can only scale up to a certain demand. Obviously, that wasn't factored in. Um, and then regulatory impacts, which you would consider for a bank, would probably be quite important, weren't actually considered as well. So there's the priorities that are going on, there's different things that are going on around consumer duty and around card not present and around. Uh, you know, all of us as retail kind of banking, banking customers weren't considered as well. So, so far this year, this numbers have changed since I sent it across to Natasha on Friday. So we're now on uh, 1,004 hires for the year against a forecast of 491, which is why I look like I've aged about 20 years in a year as well. So I want to introduce to you now the heroes. So that was the falling over bit. Sometimes you have to let that happen. What happened next? How did we kind of build that up? So we looked for um, fellow, fellow bed partners. Who else is going to be frustrated with this kind of forecast and demand? Obviously our customers, but who else? Bank exec, finance specifically. Finance, uh, I don't know if it's the same in, in other organisations, but they, uh, they factor in that it will take us 45 days to recruit certain roles, a vacancy lag uh, that they factor in and obviously squirrel that cash away. We were apparently recruiting too fast for them as well, which uh, was an interesting conversation to be had. Um, but the disaster created a narrative, it created a story in the, in the same way that um, a couple of years ago, uh, we used to be partnered with, with Horsefly uh, and actually uh, budget didn't get signed off, didn't, we didn't get re-approval during COVID to continue the partnership. Suddenly, all those requests for information, the standard response, which I think I then wanted tattooed on me was, you switched off Horsefly, we can't give you that labour market data or it won't be as accurate, it won't give us this detail. That presentation you had last year, we can't get it now. So actually, sometimes you need to let things to fall over to then build it back up. But it created a narrative. You know, actually, it's take, it's, there's more stress on colleagues. Uh, there's more uh, longer call wait times for customers. Uh, there's, you know, time to offer goes out the window. And actually, you lead on to really distressed purchases. We, you know, I've got a, a brilliant, brilliant team. Um, some of them are in the room today, so I definitely have to say that. Um, but no, they're um, amazing. And our agency usage is, is 1% uh, on those 1,000 hires. So it is really, really low. Um, but 
you know, it forces us into distressed purchases or conversations around uh, agency usage. Well, you know, we're going to need to use this risk agency or this finance agency because, you know, we'd, we'd definitely, they'd definitely be able to find us candidates quicker. You know, you fast forward two weeks and actually the direct team have actually filled it themselves because they've been waiting for candidates to come over and they've still not come over. You know, that, that just shows you kind of where, where we're kind of at and those distressed purchases that you're in. But advertising costs, uh, any kind of budgetary spend. So obviously Ben was talking about p and and budgets and forecasts earlier on. Uh, all of that goes out the window. Distressed purchases are there. LinkedIn licenses. We all have to sell an arm and a leg for LinkedIn licenses. You know, actually, that the cost of that goes up and goes through the window. And also, it, it just takes longer to get things signed off. Procurement get frustrated. Everyone gets frustrated. Um, pressure on hiring managers, uh, and then obviously from a budgetary perspective. So, the heroes of the story were the disaster. So the narrative that that created. Wonderful recruitment team. Hiring managers as well, who've been really supportive and collaborative, as you would expect from a cooperative in many instances. Um, labour markets insights. So, we got Horsefly switched back on through much blood, sweat, and tears and support from, from Steve, and we got it switched back on. And actually, you fast forward to everything that an organisation is looking to do in terms of you know, diversity recruitment, in terms of location strategy, which would have changed dramatically for most organisations during COVID. Where, is the, where are those kind of untapped talent pools? You know, actually, it's going to affect time to hire, cost per hire, being able to do things directly. Uh, and actually, you know, our labour markets insights, which I'll touch on, uh, has really helped drive the way uh, to the cost and time per hire that we're now doing, getting us those, um, those really niche roles that we've filled within that thousand. You know, there's probably 300, 400 contact centre in there, but the rest would be IT architecture, risk analysts. You know, everyone in the, in the whole of the UK seems to be looking for 45 to 55k risk individuals. So, you know, it really helps to drive and narrow down that, that kind of talent. Uh, finance as well. Who would have thought finance and budgets would be a, a, a massive bedfellow? But you know, when they're they're kind of pulling their hair out because we're you know X, Y, and Z over what they were kind of you know what a spreadsheet says, um, then you can you can easily kind of pull that back and pull on those strings. So getting the CFO involved, getting the uh, you know the leaders within finance in, in, involved, actually really helped us to the point where actually. They're supporting us with our workforce planning for this year uh, and almost looking at that kind of budget uh, reaction. The playing back in data to me that comes from the business to say about you know, attrition expected or uh, what we were expecting in terms of that kind of recruitment lag and vacancy lag that I spoke about earlier. They validate that all with me now, which would they, they, they never used to. It would almost be an independent guesstimate. It looks great on a spreadsheet. It balances up. It must be true. Um, and then the bank exec. We're really fortunate that um, you know, our executive are really supportive. If you're, we know how to, to play things, to kind of get, them, get things past them, uh, in terms of making things really visual. You know, I know that if I am um, presenting to the exec, um, you know, I ha if I don't make things really visual, really simple, I'm going to lose half the room absolutely straight away because their minds are just wired differently and then obviously there's the CFO and our CEO who was our CFO who are completely off the, off the chart in terms of numbers and detail and everything else so you need to vary it for that audience but our bank exec are absolute superstars and if you're if you um, talk about pain points and talk about impacts of pain points they're really supportive and ultimately you know, it makes things a lot easier when we can, we can measure it against the bank scorecard. So on our scorecard, we've got the exec have got diversity targets, the exec have got budgetary targets, uh, they've got uh, you know, a variety of different targets around the customer as well. They can't meet any of those scorecard targets, which are linked to bonus. Uh, without it. So suddenly we've got the bank exec on board. I'm not saying it's down to the potential bonuses, but there might be an echo of truth in that. Um, so just a quick interlude in any story, just how we actually use the market data. So this is one of our recruitment strategy plan documents that we use on every single briefing, uh, which really helps us to paint the picture of 
the labour market, what's happening out there. You know, probably since I've been speaking, we've had another three PMs. So who knows what's what's kind of going on there? You know, it's just it's just things are moving at such pace that since you've all been in here today, I mean, God, it's countless how many offers that your teams would have been putting out there and putting out to candidates and offers that would have been accepted or declined probably accepted and declined between people in this room as well, which is quite an interesting one. Um, but you can see here, we really detail, and, and actually one thing we did learn is that we use the market labour insight on every single vacancy, every single briefing. And you can see there that in big, bold letters, I make sure the team have put it out there, powered by Horsefly Analytics. So next year, there is absolutely no uh, budgetary issues, or this year, no budgetary conversation. Um, Actually, I probably shouldn't say that with Steve in the room because the price will be going up. But yeah, yeah, no, 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 no budgetary uh, issues this year as they've been in the past because actually they can see what's happening in this. Uh, uh, when we look at this kind of oper operational resilience and oversight role, really exciting risk role. Um, if you look at the, uh, the gender in there, actually we can talk about how we're outperforming it, how we're outperforming it at a shortlist, what, um, you know, where people have come from, the backgrounds, the salary information as well, which has been, been vital and we're really lucky. We've got such a great partnership with our reward team as well. Our bank reward team are market leading and you know, they make some really good decisions around how to support people and colleagues, especially in the current environment. But they use Horsefly uh, as well. But in terms of detail, we can kind of pull it through. Every single vacancy, every single hiring manager gets this up front. So it's almost a contract to, to what we're doing and how we deliver it. So you can see in terms of when we're playing back in terms of women in finance targets, you know, we've drew, uh, you know, improved dramatically over the, the course of the year. So at the start of the year, our shortlist probably contained probably 28%, 30% female. August, uh, we had 70% offers at band B level, which is our exec minus two level uh, for fem female talent. And that is in IT architecture, risk and finance. So that isn't in the kind of traditional kind of retail areas as well, or HR. Um, so uh, enhanced experience for, for hiring managers, but enables us to control the narrative. If I get a phone call from an exec to say, oh God, I'm hearing that it's taking too long to recruit from X, Y, and Z manager which is a common, common theme because they're obviously, you know, oh, it's not, it's not my fault. It's definitely not my fault. It's the recruitment. Recruitment's taking too long. I can just go bang in 30 seconds, send this across. This is exactly what we said. Yeah, that hiring manager went on holiday for three weeks, didn't tell us, hasn't given us feedback on candidates. Potentially it's not our, our kind of issue why it's taking so long then. So we push that through and it helps us drive the conversations around um, each vacancy, but also how we're delivering against bank scorecard, which is, which is vital as well. So back to the story. So the data alliance. So one of the reasons for me, unfortunately, missing the start of this morning is I had a, a, a third exec session in three weeks. So each of the exec now are having to come along and present their forecasts for next year. So their forecast, We've changed it, so rather than it being focused on their business area, so how many people do we need in risk, how many people do we need in finance, how many great people do we need in retail, we've actually looked at the 10 strategic aims of the bank. So what projects are critical for the bank? And then actually looking at those verticals, what do we need to deliver it? So instead of saying, actually, we've got this project going on in retail that no one's mentioned at all to anyone apart from on one call and then you know, expect everyone to know about it, um, We've got that all called out, so we know the 10 strategic aims, and if it isn't linked to one of those 10 strategic aims of the bank, it's gonna get bumped down in terms of priority. So that's where we've changed the lens this year, and each of the exec have had to go away, take back their first cut, which said that their growth next year of the bank, they were gonna look for 400 vacancies. I think we've heard that story before. So we took that back and pushed back on it and said, actually, What's, is that based on attrition? What's the growth plans? What are the interconnecting stories here? Actually, in SME and in our retail business, you're recruiting exactly the same person at exactly the same time, but you don't talk to each other about it. So it's enabled us to really look at those key projects and drive that forward as well. So it's a real change of focus for us, and it's much more strategic rather than business aligned. 
which is super, super helpful. You know, for us and for anyone in the team, we can then challenge back and say, actually, is it, is it linked to consumer duty? Is it linked to our customer? Is it linked to uh, simplification, which is a big one for us because, you know, if anyone knows about the kind of history of the cooperative bank, obviously there's been mergers, acquisitions, and with that separation from co-op group, yes, we are separate. Um, you know, all of those things come with a massive tech stack, which has been kind of interlinked for, for, for years as well. So it's enabled us to really uh, separate the focus out and really focus on each strategic goal rather than business areas. Um, so joint approach, as I said, is, it's, all oh, right, great. I didn't realize you needed, um, we needed credit risk underwriters because we're growing our mortgage business. Yeah, of course you do. And then we need someone to train them. And then we need someone to do the payroll. You know, all of that is interlinked. So uh, AIM facilities, this is really helping shape our demand for where our resource will be, locations across the UK, uh, sunny Leek, sunny Skelmersdale, sunny Manchester. Uh, it's really helped us kind of focus on, on those areas as well. Um, and then, um, you know, resourcing plan, it's clear, it's aligned, hopefully. We've got the final session when I'm off stage here. So I'm interested to see the arguing that goes on in the, in the last one, because at the moment, it's really funny with the execs. They are literally, you know, it is like me and my brother when we were growing up, who's got the most Rice Krispies? That is exactly where we're at. So it is perfect because actually we're playing through, we're seeing the data, we're selling the story. You know, we can say actually, you know, Mrs. Exec, Mr. Exec, that's not linked to the strategic goals. So we're going to bump that down to a level three in terms of priority. So we're not going to pick that up till May. Everyone's clear on that. Everyone knows about that now, so it really helps us drive it. And obviously, the, the labour market data as well will be used on every single vacancy. So once we've got that kind of growth plan and list, and that's uh, our demand plan that comes off the back of it, um, we're then playing that back through to say, actually, we know you want to do it in this order, and you want to recruit X, Y, and Z in this order, but that architect is going to take three months. This person is going to take two months. We need to start that now to be able to align to get projects kicked off and underway. Um, so that's where it's really helped us and helped our focus as well. So the exec sessions have been brilliant. Uh, HR, and focus, uh, HR and finance are aligned. So actually, with workforce planning sessions are delivered jointly by finance and, uh, and TA as well, which is you know, a huge, huge win for us. And then obviously, support functions. How much IT kit we need? How much media do we need to be buying? You know, what does desk space look like? All those kind of things can then feed off the back of that as well, which is why it's kind of critical. And then in any true story, you always end with the kind of epilogue at the back. So I've got the key takeaways for you. So definitely use your Disney disaster. Whatever that disaster is, and it's, it's almost like you teed me up earlier, but um, whenever you, you, you know, you've got a disaster, you've got something, you've got a narrative to hook onto, be playing that back at every single point. You know, now when I'm on a exec, uh, exec call, when I use the words horsefly or high of you, uh, they smile. And that's because it's constantly played out and I constantly feed that back to them. Build your team of heroes as well. So actually, if, if our workforce, plan, workforce planning is terrible, who else does this impact? Who else is gonna you know, be putting their hair out over this? Let's get together and let's do a joined up approach. Use data from varied sources as well. Um, and then tie back to your company's strategic goals. So rather than the business areas, thinking about it holistically and thinking about those 10 strategic goals or whatever they are for your organization and just try and join those, those back in together. So hopefully today it feels like I've maybe written your business case for Danny at Foresight to, to, to go out there in terms of workforce planning. Um, this was our disaster story. Hopefully you know, you'll be able to take some stuff away from it and, and, and avoid the pitfalls or it's a common theme for you all as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you.